Okay, so, um, well, thank you everyone for, for coming for, for this talk. I hope uh, you enjoy it. And, um, and if uh, for some reason you are not uh, hearing properly, please interrupt and I'll try to put a, a microphone to see if it works a bit better. So it's with pleasure that I'm going to, to, to share a bit with you my, some information on the birds of, of the Gulf of Guinea Islands, a place that I, where I've been working now, I, I only I counted now, so it is a bit scary, but for 25 years now. Um, yeah, to pass the... And um, I'm still just in the beginning to take the things off the zoom out of my screen. like this. So that there's my address in case after the, the talk you want more information or to know how to get to the islands and things like that. Um, I'm from CBU. CBU is a research center in biodiversity from the University of Porto, where I'm more associated with a TropiBio group. And um, I'm also uh, associated with the Natural History Museum of the University of Porto. So both of these institutions from the University of Porto in the north of, of Portugal. Um, I've been also a research associate of the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology in Cape Town, where I've, been, I've done my master's in conservation biology there. I then went on to do, um, there already my project was on, uh, on, on the Gulf of Guinea in the Grey Parrot of Prince Island. And then I've, I went on to, to the University of Edinburgh, where I did my PhD on the bird speciation in the Gulf of Guinea Islands. And then I've been, since I've been working on the islands and with other biologists and conservationists, we've always been interested to develop a platform where you could congregate and uh, put together our efforts to everything related with biodiversity in the Gulf of Guinea. And so we just created recently the Gulf of Guinea Biodiversity Center to, 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 to work as this platform. Of course, all along these years, I've been having support from many people, both from the institutions, local and international institutions, and also for many funders, uh, and especially in the, the Portuguese um, FCT there on the bottom, which is the, 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 our uh, science foundation uh, from, from the government. But there's really been support from uh, all, all, all over and it's very important for, for the works to, to proceed. It's a place where we are quite welcome to work and, uh, and so it's quite nice. Just in relation to, the, to, to this talk, I would like to, to thank to the photographers. It's more than these three, but uh, these are those, so Alexandre and Andrew that are professional photographers. And uh, Lars Peterson is a, a bird and an excellent photographer and you should check, check his site and he always allows us to use his photos. So because in a presentation is made mostly of photos, I think it's important to, to highlight this, although I try to put the names always in the photos when I, I present. So my talk, I'll first present the, the, the setting, of course, what is the Gulf of Guinea, a bit on the human history, and then in what, uh, what brought me here, it's about the birds, but also their evolution. So here we are uh, in Africa, and that's the Gulf of Guinea, the, just uh, where, we, where we, we find these uh, islands, quite spectacular islands. Um, so when I study as a biologist, uh, the, 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 the system, so I also include, so I know we've spoken about Cameroon, but I also include in my, in, in my the perspective, to have a good perspective of this system, the Mont Cameroon, so just there on, on the coast. Uh, which can, which is very similar to to these islands uh, that I'm studying. And so, and there are relationships between the the fauna and flora of both. So it's important to have it in mind. Um, and then we have a one land bridge island, Bioko. So land bridge island in the sense that it's part of the continental shelf. Therefore, it was often connected to the mainland. It was a peninsula of the mainland. The last time it was connected was around ten thousand years ago. And then we come to the oceanic islands. So these are islands that have never been connected to the mainland, neither to each other. And they are in total, they only make 1000 square kilometers. So they're relatively small. And Anubon, the one that is further apart, uh, it's um, only 17 square kilometers. And you can see it, the entire island in this photo here, just to see. Still, it has the, the forest and it has endemic species in such small place. 
Uh, why the slide is not moving? That slide. Okay. So they are part of the Cameroon line of volcanoes. This is a very like 1,000 to 1,700 kilometers line of volcanoes. It extends all the way into, into Nigeria. Um, and you see this very curious uh, fact that you have there in gray in the map, it's a rift, and then you have the in a Y form, and you have the volcano line that is also in a Y form. And this is just because so the, it's the rift that uh, where the volcanoes uh, that created the, the, the volcanoes, but then the African plate rotated and, and got displaced from where the volcanoes are. So it's, it's a unique feature, or, or geological feature in the earth. So the islands are very old. But still, they had an intense volcanic activity until very recently, and it's still active in the Cam Mount Cameroon, as you can see here in this photo, and which shows how an island, an oceanic island, appears for the first time. It's a barren uh, place where there's no life at all. Because of this intense volcanic uh, activity, this, the, these islands have the peculiarity that although they are very old, they should be maybe almost very eroded and almost like atolls, they actually look like a very young island. So with very high mountains and steep, uh, steep slopes. Uh, and being, being in, the, um, in, the, um, in, the, in the equator, near the equator, it's an equatorial climate. So basically it's rain more or less uh, all the whole year round uh, and with, uh, with some small uh, dry seasons. With precipitation like in Mount Cameroon and in Saint Tomé, being, being some of the highest in the, in the world with nine liters of rain a year. Uh, so just, to, it's very mm -hmm. impressive. Um, I have trouble changing the slide. Sometimes it goes, sometimes not. So that's, so this, um, so this is like a campsite in the, often things are quite wet as a, and in the good forests, it's pro, it's wet all year round. And this rain plus the steep cliffs and sometimes quite difficult, difficult terrain uh, it made the, the Jose Correa, a, a collector for the American Museum of, of Natural History, to complain quite bitterly. Although, from as you can see in this sentence, um, although from our side we are we quite enjoy working there. So, but this topography very well marked, it creates a gradient in temperature and precipitation, which will then reflect on the, the vegetation you have there. So you have a lowland rainforest up to 800 meters, the original vegetation, and then it turns into mountain forest. And then at higher altitudes, you have the mist or mossy forest. So that the uh, Mount Cameroon would be the, what we call generally Afro-mountain forest. So with lots of lichens and, uh, and moss, they're very wet, very beautiful as well. Then, much higher up, you have the um, the you have um, you have the alpine meadows, but this only occurs in Mount Cameroon and Bioku, and you have a tiny hint of that, but really tiny in terms of plant species that show up unexpectedly on on the near the peak of Saint Tomé. So this topography it creates the also the these big mountains the rain shadows that is the 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 the, the winds that bring the rain come from the southwest and so they but so it's the southwestern flanks of the mountains that get most of of the rain uh, so like in Sontume you can have nine thousand millimeters of rain in the southwest but then in the north you can only you can have about six hundred millimeters a year which creates a big difference and therefore for example in Sontume you had um, in the north, what the very nice dry forest, but they have been almost all converted into destroyed and due to charcoal production. Uh, also in the north, because it's drier and because also of human action, you have in some islands this look of uh, like a savanna look, but it's more uh, derived from the human impact in, in these drier areas. And of course, as in all equatorial oceanic islands, you also have lots of uh, postcard beaches and it's very nice to dive. Uh, when you come into human history, just to give you a brief, um, a brief outlook. So uh, this is in principle, but uh, Bioko has always, a, uh, it has an ancient human presence. So it was part of the, of the mainland. It's also just very close to the mainland, 30 kilometers just there. You see it from Cameroon, from Limbe, it's just around the corner. Uh, but Prince Pesantumé and Anubon, they were discovered by the Portuguese in the late 15th um, century. 
and uh, no one uh, with it was uninhabited, so no one lived there, and it was colonized from the early uh, 16th century. With the colonization, uh, of course, you very quickly you lost most of the lowland rainforest, which was used for first for sugarcane production initially, uh, and then later and up to today, mostly for cocoa and also coffee. Um, the result is that then mountain forest was much less affected than uh, than uh, lowland forest, but still there is coffee on its lower range and also some uh, hort horticultural production in some parts. But the mist forest, uh, also more inaccessible, uh, was hardly affected. Still, uh, this the fact that it's cocoa and coffee that predominate. It's quite uh, as as a as an as in the agriculture. It's quite good news because. For, for growing them, you use shade coffee plantations, so which are which mimic the structure of the forest in a way, no, not completely, but it, it it's uh, suitable to many of the endemic species, no, not just birds. So this is much better than having open habitats uh, like uh, for corn or 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 manioc. So this is still a a, a nice option in a way. Not to, uh, we also, in terms of habitats, you also have these secondary forests with the very difficult to walk through. So this is where the forest is regenerating after after the the, the field are, uh, the plantations were abandoned. So this happened a lot after uh, independence from Portugal in the 70s and 1970s. But uh, but now because also population is increasing, this is being slightly reversed. This is just a quick overview for you to have an idea of the population of of these islands. But still, so uh, what's important is that at least for now, uh, the Gulf of Guinea Islands remains surprisingly well preserved. When we know about what happened to most oceanic islands, I think here it's still a, a very special case. Although it has now, it's facing now lots of strong, strong pressures. It's, it might be at a turning point, but there's still lots of room to try to, 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 to work with things and development that work for biodiversity and the people as well. So we'll, we'll see. And because of this, the, these islands have a unique biodiversity, which is characterizing by having huge uh, levels of endemism across many groups, like over 60 lands, uh, terrestrial land snakes are, land snails are endemic. Uh, here you see that I put lots of frogs because this is quite unique oceanic islands to have endemic uh, amphibians for the simple fact that amphibians are intolerant to salt water. So this we could, uh, could discuss this later. How, how did they manage to get here? Also a shrew, it's also quite unique to have endemic shrews. You have, we have two uh, in these islands, so it's, it's also quite, quite special. But we come now to, to the endemic birds. This is a, a Santomé Paradise flycatcher, a male. It's black, fully black, like uh, curiously the, the Paradise flycatcher of the Seychelles Islands on the other side of Africa. The only two where the male are fully black. So Mount Cameroon being on the mainland, it, it has a high diversity of species, but it, it has only two endemics. Still quite surprising for a, a mountain within a, the mainland. So these two species only occur on, on Mount Cameroon. Uh, okay, I am, I'm speaking about endemics, assuming that everyone knows best. I see lots of people from South Africa that were, it were a country full of endemisms of all sorts, especially plants, but also birds. But so I mean endemism, not just as, um, a species is endemic to one place, not only because it only occurs there, but because it originated there. It's in, in, in this sense that I'm um, that this is where this species was formed, and it and it only occurs there in this and this place is a small a small area, a restricted area. Um, so then uh, the Bioku, it's a land bridge island, so it was part of the of the mainland. So it has also lots of species. But because it's so close to the mainland and it was and it was split from the mainland recently, it has only two endemics. Then we get to the to the three oceanic islands, and you see immediately that, that they have quite a much poorer diversity, which is typical of oceanic islands. So, as you as you saw that the photo of of Mont, of the of the the bear Mont Cam, uh, uh, eruption uh, recent eruption in Mount Cameroon, this is our islands. Uh, come to life as bare rocks, and therefore they are only colonized by accidents. It's like species are not going to look for islands. It's just, for example, birds if they are, at, um, if at strong winds or a storm take them there. So you have much less species per unit area than, than on the mainland. But you have 
most of the species, they are unique because here you have 29 endemic species and lots of uh, subspecies as well. And curiously in this uh, three, in three, in the three oceanic islands is that they are a bit like separate worlds in the sense that as you see, where I put the stars, it's the only three cases where you have one endemic species that occurs in more than one of the islands. If not, they are all, all single island endemics. I'll give you now just a brief overview of some of these species as on islands you generally expect to see like strange things and it's true that you see them like you have you see the the Santo green pigeon with the bill reminding a bit the bill of the dodo as which was also a pigeon anyway um, and, and on islands you generally have it's uh, lands of giants and dwarfs like you had the dwarfs uh, hippopotamus and uh, elephants on uh, in Mediterranean islands um, or the elephant birds in Madagascar here on the islands you have for example, the largest sunbird, that, which is called giant sunbird from Saint Tome, the giant weaver, also the dwarf ibis, these are all from Saint Tome, and also the world's largest canary, which is called the Saint Tome gross beak. But you also have other examples of strange creatures. For example, here we have the what are called three aberrant white eyes of the Gulf of Guinea. So all except, and here you have a, the, a, a typical African white eye. Um, and what happened in these islands is that you have these strange forms, they were called these aberrant uh, white eyes, in the sense that the uh, white eyes are quite a homogeneous group of uh, small yellow birds with a white uh, feather ring on, on the eye. And on the islands, they are much bigger than, uh, than they are usually. They, they lost the green and yellow colors, and some have even lost the white eyes. So it's really strange things happening on, on islands. Even more than that, there were two species, uh, one from Sontomé, the top one, and one from Princip Island, where taxonomists uh, were unable to, to put in place in any bird family because they, you can even see from the name of the bottom species, Thresh Pebbler, it's like you, you don't know where really to put it. And, um, and, and in such cases, because they were so different and they thought they were really represented very old lineages, maybe from some extinct uh, mainland ancestors. Uh, but then when you use molecular data, which generally we use to, to, to be able to reconstruct the past history of, of the species, we found, for example, that the St. Mesh short tail is very closely related to the mountain wagtail. So to wagtails in general, but to the mountain wagtail that occurs in, a mountain, in streams of mountains in Africa, including in Mount Cameroon. Um, and the Dwarf Thresh Babbler is close to the African Eel Babbler, also in Bioku and Mount Cameroon, but so it's a Sylvia Warbler. So, so they, we slowly be, begin to, to, to understand what's happening. And what's also very nice in this island, it's that most endemic species, many of them actually, they, they, they are very common. So it's you'll get out of the plane and you'll see endemic species straight away. Some are in towns and in gardens and plantations, they are the most common birds you will see. So this is quite nice. Um, these are just some examples and all these photos from Lars Peterson. Um, but still, on the other hand, we do have some of the among the rarest in the world, so which so and that are classified uh, by the IUC, in the IUCN red list as critically endangered. So the 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 the, the category before extinction. So this includes the the Prince Trash, the dwarf ibis, the Saint Magros beak, and the um, and the Newton's fiscal. So this is a shrike only present on Saint Tome. And so again, you see this um, randomness of island colonization. So shrikes are a species from open habitats mainly. And so this one found himself on the rainforest and uh, had no, well, he adapted to it. It's like a rainforest shrike now, although it tries to look for open areas within the, the rainforest. And to this list, we can now include, probably it will be included this year as critically endangered, the recently discovered Prince Skopzal which shows this discovery uh, that uh, there's still mysteries. And even in uh, such well-studied groups as birds that we can still, that uh, these islands of Gulf of Guinea still uh, have lots of, uh, of, of secrets to, 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 for us to discover. So now going a bit like when we look, we saw all these endemics, 30 endemic species, more or less 29, depend on the taxonomists, but it's nice to put this in perspective because we are used that oceanic islands have, have, um, have uh, uh, endemic species. That's what, what we expect from oceanic islands, these uh, separate worlds in a way. So here it's, pl uh, it's plotted um, 
a chart with um, with only the small only small oceanic islands in the world that have at least one endemic uh, bird species. Those that don't have any are, are not plotted here. And if we put the the numbers of of the Gulf of Guinea Islands, including there, it's um, and bon, you, we see that they appear, although it's only three islands, but they appear to be in a completely different trajectory. So they have many more species per endemic species per unit area that we would expect from the rest of the, the pattern that we see in the world. And you can see in the bottoms just some examples to, to compare some figures. So on these three islands with 1,000 square kilometers, we have uh, uh, around 30 endemics. In the Galapagos, we have many more islands, so more opportunity to, to create new species in a much larger area and you have less endemics or for example Hispaniola it's a single island but 70 times uh, larger than these three islands and it still has, has less endemics so overall we can say that uh, the islands of the Gulf of Guinea and, and especially Príncipe and Saint Tomé they have the highest concentration of endemic bird species in the world and this uh, was uh, noticed uh, even uh, the, the, the importance for birds well, uh, noticed in several publications, starting in 1988, when the forests of Saint Tomé were considered the second most important in Africa for bird from the bird conservation perspective. Then, in 2011, the forests of Saint Tomé, Principe, and Anubon were classified as the third most important forest for bird conservation in the world. And then, uh, maybe even more spectacular, and this is not—it's a lot because of the birds, but also because of other the other endemic uh, other groups and the endemism in other groups. For example, the Santomé Natural Park was came up in the 17th position in the list of the most replaceable protected areas in the world. So this is the top 0.01 percent because this study encompassed uh, over 170,000 protected areas. So it's really uh, a lot. Even Principe was in a very high position, considering that its protected area is tiny, it's uh, very small. So it's still the top 0.15%. So, so this is just to highlight that this, uh, these forests of these small islands have really an incredible value for, for, uh, for conservation so from a biodiversity perspective. And therefore, this begs immediately the question, if they have the highest concentration of endemic bird species of the world, why? So the, the question of why you have uh, more species, so it, it can, we come into the realm of evolution and uh, of Darwin, of course. And uh, the most important, and this, so I, this is where I was saying initially before when people were coming in. So today, I may, maybe I'll not explain much about the evolutionary process itself, but maybe I'll give a hint of what we as evolutionary biologists are interested in at looking at when we, we say we're studying evolution. Or simply, why are we interested why, of how species are, arise, in a way? So the most important insight of uh, Darwin's, um, the, the Darwin's work, and this was the only figure, this is a, a crop of the only figure in, the, in his work, The Origin of Species, like this tree that branches. But the most important insight is really that um, that every species that existed, even those that went extinct and every, every species that is now around us and us as well, uh, are, we are all connected by unbroken chains of descent. What this means is really that we, we all descend from the first life form that appeared on Earth that, and we, that it's only one. So some molecules, for some reason that no one knows why, start self-replicating. And from these molecules that start making call, uh, copies of themselves, Every life form on Earth has uh, um, was appeared as a reason. Um, but in this um, process, we we have two things to look at. So first, we have this is all evolution, but generally, what uh, we can say also evolution just being the gradual change along the same lineage. So this often, which is often adaptation by natural selection. But uh, in this process, so in this figure, so in, in the bottom is the past, in the in the top is the present. You 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 have here species that at, uh, in the past that then can change. Their climate changes. There are other environments. So it is it is changing in appearance, in morphology, and we have now uh, the species that looks differently from the beginning, but it's still a single species. So it was just uh, uh, adaptation. Uh, we don't we didn't increase the number of species. And this is what people are more used like with domestication, like when you see, for example, the, 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 how, how, we, 
how we selected the corn to, to have the to be big as, as we like, but we didn't create new species. It, we just we just changed one species. So speciation, it's when one lineage splits into two or more. So it's all these branchings that we are seeing here. So this branching. But this creates the problem that we want to study. So this is what uh, why uh, the, what, what I was saying in terms of trying to show you why we are interested in this. But this first an example of um, of, of this uh, branching, uh, quite a spectacular example, and with islands as well. So this is a figure with honey creepers from the Hawaiian archipelago, and there are, there were there are probably more than seventy species. Many went extinct because of you when uh, since human colonization. But let's say around 70 species have been formed from a single ancestor that came from Russia. So a finch arrived in the, in that, into that archipelago. And in time, it just diversified into more and more species with all this huge diversity of bills. It encompasses all the diversity of bills in the passerine realm and even as uh, some shapes that don't occur anywhere else in any other family. So this is what we say the creation of diversity. This is what what makes us want to, to understand how do you create such diversity. But this is, of course, a big problem that is how can unbroken chains of descent, if they're unbroken, split. So from that first initial life form, we could expect, even if it had changed for something else, to be nowadays we would only have one species on, on the globe. And that's it, it had changed, but it's just a species occupying maybe the entire globe. Instead, we have many and many others that have gone extinct. And for Darwin, he said, he was very aware of this and he said, this is the gravest objections which can be urged against my theory. But uh, luckily, and I think he was very happy when he came up with a, a very nice hypothesis. So this is what I say that then could be for another, another talk, but just say that there is an hypothesis going on there. But in the, in the realm of islands, we can, we, we can go to, to the most simple part of it. But so when we want to study how speciation occurs, so the first thing is, to explain how can distinct morphs within the same species occur. And actually the principle of divergence of Darwin, it's a model that explains this very well. Um, using just birds, uh, I think people are used, again, and in Cameroon, you have very good examples and a very good research by the team of, of Thomas Smith. I should have put those ones here instead of, of this. These are the Tristan Buntings, but... Um, but generally, you, have, you can have several species. There are several species where you have a morph with a small bill and a morph with a big bill. So they use different resources. Um, so this is the first step. So here, but now this is the problem of speciation, is the problem of reproduction. Because it's enough for a breeding event between these two morphs, they are the same species, to occur that the difference will be immediately erased. Again, because bre breeding, you, you basically mix up the information of the parents. They are broken up and they put back together in a different order. So you basically mix up everything. So how, how do you maintain the integrity of these different morphs? This is what we want to study. And the evolution of speciation, the study of speciation is the study of how do you interrupt the gene flow? So the genetic exchange between different morphs. So there are different ways, again, for another talk, but for the islands, we can go with a drastic solution, which is geographic isolation. So it's a drastic and easy solution because if uh, populations of the same species cannot meet, that's it, they will not exchange genes. And this can, actually, it's the most common way of that, uh, that has led to speciation. So on the mainland, this can happen when you have a river of a, or a mountain coming up to between uh, splitting up the range of a species allowing species then to follow their, the po separated populations to follow their own evolutionary path. Or islands, as you see, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a perfect place. It's a separate world. So it's, you only get to islands uh, randomly and once uh, just by accident, organisms get, get to the islands. And once there, if they are isolated and they don't go back to, to the mainland, they don't exchange genes. It's very difficult to get away from an oceanic island. <laughs> So let's now look at, um, at, um, at, 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 some, at the Gulf of Guinea. So here we have this 29 endemic species. And even without doing any molecular study or any particular study, just uh, our knowledge as birders, uh, we can see that um, uh, there are 16 different families and 20 clear different lineages. So basically, of these 29 endemic species, we can just conclude very easily 
uh, that um, they, they can, there were at least 20 different uh, colonizations from the mainland. So these 20 species, they, they speciated by the easiest way. So there was an ancestor on the mainland, it arrives to an island, it's isolated, it doesn't go back to the mainland, they don't exchange genes, and it changes gradually into a, a different species. So this was what happened for most species. So it's quite a trivial solution, but it's what happened. Um, like in the, the, it happens in other archipelagos and it's actually one of the most common ways of, of speciation. We, we also have variations of the same, um, we have variations of, of the same, um, of the same method of speciation, which, but in this case, it's one ancestor from the mainland gets to an island, starts diverging there, but then from this island, it colonizes another island and then it diverges uh, there. So this happened with the trashes here, the Saint Tomé and the Prince Trash. It happens with uh, with uh, some sunbirds. So you have the giant sunbird and the and the prince or artlop sunbird. They 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 are derived from the same ancestor, and um, also with the uh, the weavers. Uh, the so the giant weaver and the prince weaver, the golden weaver, are are sister species. We call them sister species. Um, there you see the Saint Tomé weaver uh, that came from another one. And then we have the white eyes, which is uh, maybe the most interesting um, case here in the Gulf of Guinea, because it did the same thing as the Anne creepers of Hawaii, although in a much smaller scale, of course. So we had a single colonization from the mainland. So the, 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 the same um, ancestor that then gave the African white eye. So it got to, to one of the islands, we don't know which, and then start diverging into a new species. But at some stage, it colonized another island, again, diverging into, into uh, the population, that a new species or not, but diverging a bit. Then it colonized another island, or we even went back to, to the first island where they met again. And then you have two species, you have accumulations of species. So it's like a conveyor belt of, um, of speciation in a way, this system. And this is what it uh, promotes, archipel makes an archipelago radiation. Radiation in the sense that you have a stem that is the ancestor that radiates in several species. <clears throat> and this is known for the Hawaiian ornate creepers. The Darwin finches are also very famous for this. And this led to the mistake that people thought this was the normal way of speciation in birds on islands, but not at all. It's very rare. And actually, this is the third best example after the, those two, although it's many fewer species. What we also see from this research, and it's very interesting, is that the morphological novelty, so what we call this, what I showed you as the aberrant uh, white eyes, they evolved after two, only when two species, two closely related species met on the same island. So when another, when an, another white eye went back to an island that, that had already one white eye, it's this one that then changed very much its morphology and, and became this very di distinct species. And so this is probably due because these species are so closely related, even in terms of ecology, they eat the same thing. So what happens when they two meet, it's either one outcompetes the other, it's better at exploiting a, a given food so this one disappears, or this one or both start specializing in different uh, uh, resources. And, and, and like this, the two can coexist. This is also part of the model of, of Darwin's principle of divergence. And here, for example, the aberrant species in the past, people thought they represented very old uh, colonization events from species, maybe from ancestors that you don't no longer had representatives on the mainland. But instead, they were the, the youngest species at all, of all. So it's, it means that competition really uh, in, in, um, increased the rate of, of differentiation of, of the species. In, but, and it make this uh, this um, all this happen in the very recent time frame, and it makes that this is the fastest diversification document rate documented for birds, and even in vertebrates, it's one of the top ones, even compared with the famous cichlids. Although those are much more impressive, cichlids of the lakes Malawi, and but because there are many more species, of course. But in terms of number of accumulation of species, is is a par with that. Then the other group, it's the Saint Tomé grows big. I just put it here to, to, to see what we can also do with genetics. And this is a puzzle in the sense that um, it, it's, uh, it seemed as a, it, it gives us a lot of trouble about what we were reading for, from the genetics. And, and this can help us understand a bit what is happening with the, with the genetics. So, so the, it has always been a very enigmatic bird. It's one of the rarest uh, 
it's the most difficult bird to see on Saint Tomé. It was discovered in the late 19th century, and then it took more than 100 years to be seen again. In these 25 years that I've been there, I, and for this study, uh, I managed to capture four birds. So you see, it's not a very high success rate. But still, with these four birds and with the using genetics, we get some nice information. Because in terms of morphology, taxonomists were also a bit um, unsure of what it was. So often it was placed as a, as a weaver, like the buffalo weavers. But uh, most tended to say it was a canary, and, and they were right, genetic proved it. Not only it is a canary, but it is a um, sister species. So it is the most closely related species. Is the other canary or seed eater that occurs on the archipelago? which is the Prince Seed Eater, which, which, which is present on, on Saint Tomé, in Principe and in, on an islet very, in the next to Principe. Um, but so, strangely, because we, we, for, for this group, we did use lots of genetic data. We were having the very strange result of the fact that the Prince Seed Eater that occurred on Saint Tomé was more closely related to the Saint Tomé grows big than to the populations of its own species that we, as biologists, we know it's the same species. There's not, and this could only indicate that the Saint Tomé was a species, the Saint Tomé grows big was a species that has had a reason from the Prince seed eater without any geographic isolation, which theoretically it's possible in some groups, there's some examples, but it's extremely, extremely difficult. It requires lots of natural selections and lots of, but it would be fascinating. Of course, we were quite happy with this result, but still not truly believe it would be possible in a way. So to cut a long story short, and this, uh, it's, it's the fact that this, we were being tricked into this pattern because what happened here is that the Saint Tomé grows became from the, the same ancestor as the Prince Seed Eater that got to Saint Tomé. There it started diverging, but in the probably at the early stages of divergence, it, uh, it, another wave of, of this, uh, the ancestor of the Prince Seed Eater got into the island. So they were at this early stages of divergence. So they were separate, uh, separating themselves, but they were still quite close. Therefore, they interbred that problem of uh, bre two different morphs breeding. And by interbreeding, what happened is that because the reproductive barriers were, were incomplete, they exchanged lots of genes. What generally happens here, if they would be really quite close, is that they would become a single species again. But it, this didn't happen. Probably there had already some difference in the bill size, more surely. And, and then natural selection. So, so they exchanged lots of genes. But probably when, they, when each time they hybridized, you would have a bird within an intermediate bill size. That is, uh, you would have the seed eater that would have a small bill would be quite good at eating some small items of food, small seeds, for example, and the gross beak would have a, a big bill, maybe not as, as, as large as it is now for uh, larger food items. But the offspring of the hybridization events would be in the middle. So they would not be good neither in the small seeds, neither as good as the seed eater, neither in the big seeds, like neither as good as the parent, as the gross beak. Uh, therefore, they would be, they would not uh, reproduce, so they will be excluded. But this means that lots of genes could be exchanged between them, those genes that, have, um, that are not directly relevant for the, for the feeding apparatus. But those genes that are really important for the feeding apparatus would never be exchanged because this would be, these would be in the hybrids that would be excluded from the population. And here we see this. This is an example of a chromosome. We've done that for uh, the entire genome, where, where we look uh, of what, what do the different regions of the chromosome tell us. So most of them, the ones in gray, they don't tell us nothing. They don't have any, enough information because these are closely related species. They'd, but then you have in red that most actually those from those that have information, the red and the blue, the most of them give us the wrong impression of the of what actually happened. And it's just a, a few that gives the that reconstruct the, the correct history. And in these ones, often you have, for example, the genes that code for the bill size. So so this became a, a very nice model for, and it's still a very nice model to study uh, evolution and speciation when there is gene flow, and it shows that it's possible. So coming back to our, um, our main question, why are there so many endemic birds in the Gulf of Guinea Islands? So maybe I could do a very complex model and say that these 25 years has been really hard to, to get to this conclusion. But in fact, I think to be true, it can just be summarized by 
affect a look. <laughs> and what, why, what do I mean with this? It's, uh, so it's because these islands, from a bird perspective, so I mean in terms of what the dispersal ability of, um, of, uh, of uh, birds, uh, it's in a, they, this island seems to be in the perfect geographic location. Like if we do a model to where should you put islands to get the most endemic birds you could have, this maybe would be what uh, the parameters of these islands would, do, would very, be very close to it. So first uh, they are look, surrounded by an, a land mass with very, uh, very high biodiversity. So the, the Guinean and Congo Basin forests, one of the most important uh, biodiversity of, of spots of the globe. So there's lots of species around. So remember that to get to an island, oceanic island, so birds don't go there looking for islands. It's, it's just an accident. Some mig migrants that are led astray by winds or juveniles that are trying to look for a new territory and again, they get lost. But so it's a very unlikely, it's very unlikely to, for an island to be colonized. But if you have a large pool of potential colonizers, this unlikelihood becomes more likely. So if instead of the, this forest, you would have um, the Saharan Desert, you have many, many less candidates to, 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 be, to, to get to the island. So this is a, a relatively obvious thing. But it's not enough. The other uh, part that is important is that in terms of the distance of the islands to the continent. So in a way, they are close enough for many species that are led astray by winds to get there, to find the islands, to, to land on the islands. But they are far enough for, for the fact that once they get there, they don't leave it, they don't leave. Because if they would be very close to the mainland, they, they, they will be continuing inter exchange of genes. So, they, they, so speciation could not occur. So they seem to be in really in a, a perfect spot in terms of receiving colonizers, uh, species that get there, but once but far enough so that then they get on to speciate in another, other uh, two new species. Other insights from this research is again the fact that competition, so for resources when species have to, to find food or places to nest, but it's really competition drives changes because we had species there for millions of years that are very similar to the mainland ancestor. And it's then only when they met um, another species very similar, a very closely relative that, that got to the, to the same island. It's in these cases that you have this very strange, uh, um, uh, very, very different uh, species evolving and in a very, very fast rate, so very like the, 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 this, the aberrant white eyes that are called spirops, no, not even white eyes, although they are white eyes. Um, also, the other uh, factor that we were surprised initially was the fact that these are very old islands, but we don't have like uh, relic species from the very, really past. So probably this is certainly due because of the intense volcanism. Sometimes these islands would go maybe almost back to square one in a way. So most endemics are really of recent origin. And it shows that speciation is happening in these islands. It's not that they are like, um, because the, the environment is very stable here. They could be just a refuge from a species that gone extinct on the mainland. No, here speciation is happening. So the oldest species we have found so far is the Dorn Thresh Babbler with around eight million year old, but in an island that has thirty million, that is thirty million year old. So with this, I conclude just saying that uh, all these years, of course, and this research has been a pleasure and uh, and very and it's real really great to work in these islands and. It only possible with uh, with all the, the 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 people from the place that know the place and that take me to the places to even to 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 discover new species as it happened with Yal. Um, uh, and because of this, and what I've enjoyed seeing during these years um, is that the interest in biodiversity is increasing has been increasing almost exponentially, and it's because of this that uh, the. Um, the, the Gulf of Guinea Biodiversity Center was created. So it's, it's, uh, it's based on, um, it's an association based on Saint Tomé uh, and that in a way it's an umbrella for everyone that has, uh, that has been working in uh, biodiversity conservation and education. So from the, so although it's based on Saint Tomé but it's to look at all the islands of, of, of this system. So including also Equatorial Guinea. Um, with this, I conclude, I thank you for your, um, attention and I'm open to any questions if, if, if we if we have time. Thank you very much. I will and sh share I guess. Thank you so much Martin. That was just uh, so interesting. Um,
much. And um, folks, if you've got any questions, please, if you don't mind, just put them in the chat. There's a few too many here to have open mic right now. Uh, so just pop your questions in the chat and we'll pick it up. Uh, while we're waiting, Martim, I have a, I have a kind of question for you. The, the, the white eyes are kind of the, the Malawi, Malawian cichlids of the birds, right? They've got the really rapid um, evolution. I mean, they, uh, they've got the highest rate of, rate of speciation of any bird group. Yes, they're called, uh, being called a great speciator. It's like yes. A, like and, and, yeah, exactly. And, and uh, did that, does that have something to do with the, the way in which they've evolved into, into all these weird forms? Um, um, yes, uh, uh, white eyes for they have a behavior that in a way um, has almost make it, of course, it did not evolve because of that, but it makes them as like um, species that have a perfect behavior to, to speciate on islands. And this is because on, on the mainlands, on the continents, they are gregarious, they fly in flocks and they have movements around it. So if you fly in flocks and you, you get into an island, the likelihood that you can establish a population is much larger. If you get to an island alone, uh, that's it, you, that's the end of the story. But so this, so in fact, mo most of the, I think, now I forgot the number, but I think more than half, no, maybe even 60 or 70% of the species of white eyes in the world are in the uh, islands, on islands, live on islands. So, um, so their behavior allows them to colonize islands in big groups and, and speciate there. They have also, for some reason, they tend to, once they get to islands to, although they are migrants and, uh, and um, they like to move around in, on the mainland, on the islands, they quickly evolve to become sedentary. I guess those that don't do that, they die at sea. So maybe it's because of that. Yeah, the, um, the fact that they, so this would allow, if they colonize many islands, they will speciate a lot anyway. It's uh, again, because they are in separate places, they will become different species. But this um, evolution of different um, morphologies, this one only seems to happen when you have another white eye living on the same place, which is rare, that uh, happens rarely. Why this evolution of the morphology uh, happens so fast that, that I don't think we can, uh, uh, we can answer that one, but it's very surprising because they evolve really extremely fast. Uh, uh, they become so different very fast, but only when they are at least two or three together. So you see that. Could it, could it have something to do with the small, small amount of area that's available and, and bumping into another species that is, you know, occupying a similar niche to you might put some, uh, pressure for for uh, uh speciating i mean for for going into another niche and therefore evolving the features that give you access better access to the resources yes i think that that is oh, not for sure but that is our main hypothesis and what we really think it's what's happening is that the main driver of this uh, divergence that it's competition for resources and uh, for sure one becomes bigger can exploit other things uh, the other is become smaller so it's nice to see for example in Santome, i will use with my hands so, and, and this we call in, um, so when two species are, uh, are competing for the same resource, so either one or outcompetes the other one, or they, the, the best strategy is to use, is, is to specialize in resources away from this, uh, where everyone is competing, because you are losing lots. Better to go maybe to, for a resource that is not as good, but if you have less uh, animals here eating it, then it's better, you get more out of it. So, the, and this creates what you call character displacement. So character, the trait of whatever, like the bill, one will become with a bigger bill and the other with a smaller bill. And this happens in the, um, in a way where you have two, two white eyes on these islands. You have one that um, didn't change much, but became a bit smaller than what you expect from the mainland and the other became bigger. Like in, so, so that you, you, you see, it seems that- so They're actually affecting each other. Happening. Yes, they are. They are getting away from each other in the competition, uh, the competition for resources. But why they change so much morphologically? It's still very fast color. So I guess it's traits that uh, don't require many different genes to, to, to change, like color, and because they change mm. a lot very quickly. Interesting. Interesting. Any questions, folks? I, I uh, see lots. There's a few comments. Uh, very interesting presentation. Fascinating part of the world. Super presentation, thanks so much. Uh, Gulf of Guinea is on my top ranked bucket list. Thank you very much. Great presentation. 
just a question for the species with small variation but closely related when do you draw a line to separate both species as different species that's from uh, gonzalo um yes so i guess well when they live together in the same island it's more or less easy to see if, if they are not uh, uh, breathing uh, breathing but uh, if not their speciation is a continuum so you don't really draw a line you have to use the different uh, lines of evidence like in case of birds it's it's uh, song morphology uh, genetic data helps you to at least it tells you for how many million years they've been separated if they've been separated for two million years you think probably they are if they would meet again breathing would not work out if they have genetic incompatibilities it's not not for sure but it gives you an idea if they will only divergence it's only two two hundred thousand years you think probably they are still within the the species diversity variation range so they're still the same species so that there is not a, a threshold that you go over and it's a, and it's a new species it's a continuum process and and you have to use the different lines of evidence you can also compare when there are species living in different uh, areas, different islands or island and mainland, you can look at these different lines of evidence, the amount of morphological variation, genetic uh, differentiation, etc., and compare it with, um, with, the, with the same values of species that uh, live together on the mainland and that you are sure they are different species. Uh, and therefore you can uh, have coach uh, around that if at which stage you are. There's a question from Angela. Uh, sorry, it's just scrolled up. Um, is there any noticeable difference in the weather between Gulf of Guinea and the other oceanic islands? More strong winds or storms? Uh, no, no. The Gulf of Guinea, so in this area of Africa, it's where actually the storm starts building up, but then to get to to America. So here it's just the beginning. Here, the only months with some uh, with some storms is more or less April. Uh, and in general, storms are not a big issue, no, I would say. And Elizabeth is asking, what opportunities are there for visitors? Are there birding tours in these islands? Yes, there, there aren't a lot, So, but there are some regular ones that I uh, without doing any publicity, but rem remember me, remember which really go consistently. It's Nick Borrow goes there a lot, and uh, I think he goes with Bird Quest. Uh, so Nick, he has a lot of experience um birding africa so f f from cape town as well as done several uh, trips there um and then uh, and then i know that there were other recent said i don't know the exact uh, name um but but if I, I i can try to look and i'm sending another reply but these are some that i know i'm doing with some regularity or used to at least African Bird Club has done there as well, linking with trips to Gabon, for example. Um, Gonzalo responded to your answer saying, I was thinking on a genetic basis. I worked with subspecies that were completely different from other subspecies, but we could not say that we have other species, even if they are really different, like live in isolation, etc. cetera. <clears throat> I'm not, the context there matters, I think. Uh, Yes, so but um, in this case, uh, completely different in morphology. Yeah, so what, and then it depends what, what is happening. So sometimes you, you can have some quick, uh, in a way, if you, see, if you see one speciation, in a way, uh, two species become, you know, different. Most of their genome will really be the same to, to start with. It's just those genes of the traits that matter like when it's when it's ecological driven speciation a bird a big bill small bill you, you sometimes you can have just very few genes underlying the 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 morphology of the bill and so if um and then the species maybe they don't breed anymore they become re, 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 reproductive re, uh, sorry they don't breed anymore uh because um because for example the there is some imprinting where the big bill birds only breed with big bill birds. It's called assortative mating. Therefore, although genetically they could breed, they are all more basically the same except in the, the genes for bill side and for the choosing of the mate. That, that's it. They are different species. But in that case, we would have to observe that. And uh, But even if genetically, they would be almost the same. So you, you have that. You always have to use 
the information you have, I guess, and do your own decision, your expert decision. Right? Yeah, that's the trouble with species. I, I mean, I was a biologist for many years and uh, described quite a few new species. Some of them were very quickly, uh, um, you know, torn apart, and but some of them still remain. And it's all it's uh, yes because people all about making to, the yeah. people might tend to oversplit and and by doing this we. We eliminate the fact that evolution is based on speciation on on the on variation of, of within the species. So, if every bit of variation is described as a species, in a way, it's not incorrect. But again, you still you then you lose a bit the um, what makes a species is the capacity to to speciate. Uh, it has is it, it is to have all that variation. At least some. Um, Sasha is asking. Uh, thank you, Martin. I my question is about the bon uh, bonnet yeah. uh, seed eater. Yes, is there a detectable build difference from the uh, princes? Uh, yes, between uh, the islands. So for those because I didn't went Bonnet, Bonnet, it's an islet. It Bonnet, Bonnet islet. So it's basically it, it mean, in translation in English is the caps or jockey's caps islet. It's that islet that I showed there alone to as an example of an island. So it's an islet that was part of Princip, and again with the rise in sea level in the last ten thousand years, it became split from Princip. But so you have seed eaters on Saint Thomas, Princip, and in that small islet, and the three populations are well differentiated, both morphology and genetically. And it's really interesting the Bonnet one because the Bonnet is only two kilometers from um, from Princip. It's on the side you see Princip there, but they they are not exchanging genes or so very very little a few genes. So they evolve a different behavior, they evolve a different body, and they are like the bird that seem even to have been um, in terms of morphology, uh, uh, the wing to, 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 to body size ratio, like seems to be on the way, not, doesn't fly that much. It's a tiny islet. It's, a, it's really a very small islet. And in the islet is dominated by native oil palms. And it eats most of that oil palm, the oil that it tries to get inside. So it has, it has the, the, the beak that is more stout, more stronger build to, to go for these um, palm nets, which in turn are giant palm nets or uh, kernel. Kernels are very big and you don't have that on principle. So we, you wonder if there was, there is some co-evolution going on there, the, the palm tree trying to protect itself from the predation of the seed eater, but that's just speculation. Okay, I think this is the last question from Tom. Can you give a proportion of endemic versus non-endemic species? Uh, I would, I'd have to see them. I have all these figures. I just wrote a chapter about it with a colleague recently, but I'll, I'll have to, to check. But most of, of them, of the land bird species, um, let's see. If we have 666 land bird, maybe we have 100 and maybe it's half, because many of the non-endemics are introduced or maybe it's three quarter endemics. It's, for example, if you go to a forest on Saint Tomé, so in the, the, the native habitat, you only see uh, endemic species, for example. So the non-endemic are more human associated species and that are associated with plantations like uh, wax bills, uh, bishops, uh, so you don't have a lot. Then you have, of course, seabirds. I didn't talk about them, and so those are native. And, and there is even one seabird, the storm petrel, that might be an endemic uh, species or subspecies. Uh, we, we haven't, that's one of the issues we haven't managed to solve yet because it, it seems to be breeding inside the forest and we haven't found a, got any samples yet. Uh, Ricardo Lima, so the, the colleague, the, I said that uh, we just wrote the recent um, a, a revised checklist of the birds of, of the islands. So he put the link there for you to see the numbers. Now, in the middle of the, all this questioning, I'm not be able to. Hello. So I think this, uh, that's it. We'll, we'll finish up. Grant is asking me via direct message whether your talk will be on, on our YouTube channel. It will. Um, and uh, with that, I think I'll thank you very much, Martin. It's, uh, it's uh, been a real, real pleasure. And uh, I think everybody's learned a lot. And uh, you know, the level of interest that people are showing is very good. So this is, uh, this is great. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for coming, listening. And, and yes, go, go out there to, to visit. 
and hopefully we'll uh, get you back sometime and get you talking about some of the other wonderful places you've been. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> With pleasure. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks okay, very so much. And uh, uh, yeah. Ricardo, has, uh, Ricardo has put there the value. So from this uh, 66 resident species, you have the 29 endemic, 17 uh, uh, endemic species, 17 endemic subspecies, and only 17 possibly non-native. So you see, most of the, the resident land birds are endemic, either at species or subspecies level. So in that case, like at a 90% endemism. All right, thanks very much. And thanks everybody for coming. And hopefully we will see you in March again on Learn the Birds and uh, take care and enjoy whatever is left of your day, night, Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.